We feel the excitement in the air. The flags are flying. The clock is ticking. And there are billboards and posters all over town. But if there's one film that really captures the spirit of the Olympics, that's Chariots of Fire. <laughs> So whether you like it or don't like it, it's special because it touches people and finds people in a place they're not expected to be found out. <laughs> this film is about good values, good, good, good human values. It gave virtue to my belief that whatever you achieve is only achieved by hard work. It's about two Olympic athletes who beat the odds to win gold for Great Britain. So I want to uncover the story behind the real chariots of fire. You know, every actor has a film that stands above the rest. A film that means something special, has a lasting effect. But for me, that film was Chariots of Fire. It's based on the true story of two men who beat the odds and won gold for Great Britain. Harold Abrams was Jewish and struggled against anti-Semitism. He ran to win in an era of amateur competition. Eric Little was a devout Christian. He put his beliefs before king and country and famously refused to run on a Sunday. It was my first major film role. I played a character called Lord Lindsay. I was 28 years old. Me and a bunch of other actors ran barefoot in the sea behind me. It was a day I'll never forget. The most awful memory of the physical demands of that movie was running along the beach. It was literally a mile. You know, it's interminable. All right, boys, going again. Oh, God, no. Can you go that further this time? <laughs> so they had on another two or three hundred yards. Thirty years on, I've decided to go on a journey. I want to retrace the footsteps of Abrams and Little. Find out about the real men behind the movie characters and what drove them to Olympic glory. Jewish immigrant who made a small fortune as a financier. Athletics was in the family's blood. His much older brothers were both Olympians. And Sydney had been to Cambridge, competing for the university in the long jump. They encouraged the young Harold by devising time trials. And if he failed to meet them, they'd hit him over the head with a newspaper. He arrived in Cambridge in 1919, a year after the end of the First World War. Morning. Good morning, sir. It's time to see Sir Alan first. I'm meeting the incoming master of Keyes College, 
where Abrams went to university. So, Alan, very nice to meet you. Welcome to Keith. Thank Let you. Show you around. Thank you so much. I understand that Harold had a brother here. Yes, his brother was at Emmanuel College. Okay. Um, his brother was a fine sportsman. And Harold was envious of his brother and wanted to emulate him and, in fact, overtake him. Right. So his brother spurred him on. But in the movie, he wasn't a talented older brother that drove Harold to be the fastest man at Cambridge. He was Abraham's. What do you know about him? Reverend chap. Jewish. His father's a financier in the city. Financier? What's that supposed to mean, I wonder? Harold's father sent him to Repton, a public boarding school in Derbyshire. It was here that his athletics flourished, but he felt that the headmaster, Geoffrey Fisher, singled him out for being Jewish. These are the very rooms in which Abrahams lived when he was a student, and they would hardly have changed since then. That's my father, a Lithuanian Jew. He is alien. He's as foreign as a Frankfurter. And a kosher one at that. My own favourite seat is the one in the dressing gown. You get to know him. You get to know him very well. And I think it's a very important scene because he, he, he develops some forgivability, if you know what I mean, in that scene. A lot of the stuff he does later, a lot of the more abrasive things he does, you know that where, it's, where that's coming from. Sometimes I say to myself, hey, steady on, you're imagining all this. And then I catch that look again. Catch it on the edge of a remark. Feel a cold reluctance and a handshake. Nigel, this is a college chapel. It dates back to 1393. It's the oldest chapel that's been in continuous use in the Cambridge College. Do you think he was aware of anti-Semitism at Cambridge at the time? I think he probably didn't suffer from it much at all in Cambridge, because he was such an outstanding athlete that people admired him. But he had a chip on his shoulder. Oh, definitely, but he inherited that from being at Repton. In the movie, the anti-Semitism sort of is what drives Harold. But uh, if that wasn't the case, what was, what was driving him? Well, I think the anti-Semitism definitely did drive him. He wanted to prove himself and show he was better than other people. I attached so much importance to my athletics as a means of demonstrating that I wasn't inferior. This played a very big part in, in my life. There was a certain amount of anti-Semitism when I was a young man. There's a certain amount now. But I was so bent on demonstrating my superiority over other people, both at school and uh, at the university, that I banked everything on athletics. So how good an athlete was he? What, what really interests me, having done a bit of research here at Keith's library, is how good an athlete he really was. I mean, in 1919, at the Intercollegiate Championships, uh, he won the 100 yards, the 440 yards, and the long jump. Incredible. And also, Wembley Stadium on July 21, yes, he won the 100 yards, Mr. Abrams. He also won the 220 yards and the long jump. He was an incredible athlete. And then, looking at these photographs, I have to put my gloves on for this because they're very old. They're even older than me. Here he is in 1920, a young man. You can tell in the next photograph here, 1922, he's very much in control. He's the sort of the boss, really, honorary secretary. And he's changed from being a boy into a man. And then two years later, he wins the 1924 Olympic gold medal. Apart from running like the wind, Harold was able to exercise his aptitude for public performance by joining various societies. Here we go, Delphic Club, Debating Society. But here, the film really got it right. 
He was a member of Gilbert and Sullivan Society, and he's mentioned it in this book here, um, H.K.P. Smith in his solos, and the duet with Mr. Abrams was enthusiastically received. One thing, just to conclude, he wasn't very good at was studies, because he only got a third. Maybe he was having too much fun. <laughs> Well, while, I, while I'm here in Cambridge, I thought I couldn't resist having a look at the Trinity Quad, where my character runs against Harold Abrahams. We couldn't film here, and I, I want to find out why. Your name is College, if you please, son. Lindsay. I race beside my friend here. We challenged in the name of Repton, Eden, and Keith. The Great Court Run is a Cambridge tradition. Students would try to dash around the perimeter in the 43 seconds it takes the clock to strike 12. About uh, 32 years ago, I was just getting ready to do the dash around the uh, quad there, and I was told, no, 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 you're, you're, you've got to leave Cambridge. Do you have any idea why we were thrown out? The university is about study, it's about teaching, it's about learning. And maybe there were fears that you know, a very large production in Great Court, right in the very centre of the college, was going to cause a lot of disruption. I, I, I had the pleasure of coming back in, I think it was 1985, for lunch, and uh, I sat next to one of the deans who said, you know something, we should have been um, let you film here because you, know, you made the film anyway, and uh, they regarded it as a slight error of judgment. Do you think that's the general consensus here? Yeah, I think if you were to ask again today, you would probably get a different answer. My character was based on a man called Lord Burley, who was the first person ever to complete the Great Court Run. Surprisingly, in real life, Abrams never attempted it. Harold Abrams may have been the fastest man in England, but there was another runner in Scotland who would become his greatest rival, Eric Little, a man propelled by his belief in God. I'm on a journey to uncover the real story of Harold Abrams and Eric Little, the two British athletes immortalized in Chariots of Fire. Since filming, I now run pretty well every day, and composer Vangelis' theme to Chariots of Fire brings running alive. If you can remove yourself from the irony and having heard it in the times and seen sketches, it's a really beautiful piece of music, and a really beautiful piece of cinematic music, without any doubt. It's memorable. You, you hear it now on a summer evening, you hear somebody playing it, and all the images of Chariots of Fire come surging by. You know, that is an athletics tune, isn't it? Probably play that to a bunch of young kids and they'll be there, you know, doing the slow-mo running. But would you believe it, this iconic anthem came incredibly close to never being heard. We'd done the movie, we'd mixed it, finished the film. Uh, and literally a few days later, I was in a restaurant. The phone rang at the reception. And I don't know how Dan Gellis tracked me down, I said, my wife. And, uh, David, uh, and come, I must see you. Anyway, to long story short, he drives round. We, halfway through a meal, we got up, went outside, he's sitting in his Rolls Royce, uh, and he, um, he had a cassette. cassette. We sat in the back, and he put the cassette in the car, and boom, 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 boom. But I heard what is all too familiar. And I can honestly say, every hair on the back of my neck just stood up. Asked what he was, he said, well, it's an ode to my father, who was an Olympic athlete. So it's sort of, it all sort of fitted in. Extraordinary. And our screenwriter, Colin Welland, found inspiration for the title of the film in another rousing anthem, Jerusalem. Blake's line, Bring Me My Chariots of Fire, Colin knew he had our title. Eric Little 
Eric Little was sent here to Elson College, a school for the sons of missionaries. He was born in China in 1902, two years after Abrams. Eric was just six years old when he arrived with his older brother, Robert. Was it important having a brother here? I think so. I mean, the school functioned as an extended family, but I think Rob was sort of not only a brother, but a surrogate parent in some way as well. Mm. So they, they kind of were a family together with their family really in China. He didn't see his parents for sometimes, I think, seven years at a stretch. He wrote every week, but and they wrote to him, but he would not have seen them for seven years. What, what did he do in the school holidays? Uh, he would have gone to Guardians and been, been with Rob. So, so again, surrogate parents in a way. So, here I am, in the rogues gallery, all the old sporting photographs. And here's Eric, and there's his other brother, Rob, who looks very, very dominant and in charge. This side is the rugby side, and here's Rob again, he's captain of the rugby, and there's Eric. He's still looking a bit sort of timid in the background, but if you come down here, 1918, Rob's left, and look how Eric's sort of grown in stature, he's much more in control. My visit to Alton showed me that for this college, religion and sport went hand in hand. The young Eric only saw his parents once in 11 years, as they continued their missionary work in China. This mix of Christian and athletic discipline defined the man little would become. In Chariots of Fire, Eric Little was played by Ian Charlson, who for me brilliantly captured the spirit of the man. When he's giving a speech to the assembled companies in the Highlands about uh, being a Scotsman, being a Scot, and suddenly in the middle of the speech, uh, um, there's a... Thank you for reminding me that I am and will be whilst I breathe. A Scot. Instead of being thrown by the cow moon, he laughed and said, I went with the moment, said, I am and will remain a Scot. And then what also then happened, of course, is the audience, which we had a, we had a nice reverse shot, and all the people listening to him, they laughed as well. So it's a marvellous moment of naturalness, entirely created by the fact that the actor involved didn't say, oh, cut. Eric Little was born in China, educated in London, but saw himself first and foremost as a Scot. So I've come to Edinburgh, the place Little called home, to discover how his identity developed as a Christian and a sportsman. What does Eric Little mean to you? He was a great Scotsman, he was a fantastic runner, a very famous runner at the time, and we remember him. Do you think he was a Scottish hero? So all, all of your generation yeah. would know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we know, so we know. We weren't with him, we know. Yeah. 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 You're far too young for that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you do Chance of Fire? Chance of Fire. Did you do it? Chariots of Fire on the bagpipes. First time I've ever heard that. <laughs> Eric Little followed his brother Robert here to Edinburgh University to study pure science. He would have been taught in these very rooms. But his time here was defined by his overriding passion for sport. I'm going to the university library to discover just how good he was. Unlike Harold Abrams, he seems to be the rather middle-aged looking man. Physically quite small, not, not really like, like a athlete of today. But looking at these um, annual sports programs of the period, 
he could see that little 100 yards, little. 220 yards, little. 440 yards, little. 220, little. Well, everything. Amazing sportsman. Wasn't just running as he did either. He played rugby. But he didn't just play it, he played it really well. There's a picture of him here. He played for Scotland eight times and won seven of those. Here he is mentioned in a student magazine. He had a rare combination, pace and the gift of rugby brains and hands. Makes openings, snaps, opportunities, gives the dummy to perfection, does the work of three if necessary in defence and carries unselfishness almost to a fault. And that, to me that sort of kind of sums the man up. It goes with his religious feelings and being unselfish is part of it, of the deal, I suppose. As a sporting hero, Little's name was known throughout Scotland. And because of his fame, he was a key speaker at Christian rallies. Little now had a platform to preach his beliefs. I want to compare faith to running in a race. Then where does the power come from to see the race to its end? From within. Eric Little and Harold Abrams were the two fastest men in Great Britain, so it was inevitable they would meet. Well, this is Stamford Bridge, home of Chelsea football. But in July 1923, it was an athletics ground, and it's where Harold Abrams first met Eric Little. And there were fireworks. I'd like to wish you the best of success. Thank you. And may the best man win. Harold was so confident he was going to win. He thought Eric's unorthodox running style of flailing arms was no match for him. Get to your marks. Get set. Now these two athletes would find out who was the best. Eric smashed Harold, pulverized him by four yards. Harold was devastated. I don't run to take beatings. I run to win. If I can't win, I won't run. So he went out and got himself the best trainer in the world. He was called Sam Musabini, seen here with Harold in this rare film. I spent the whole winter for the first time concentrating on style trying to perfect my stride and my starting under El Masabini with his great fanatical theory about arm action. I use my arms very much more than the modern sprinting bit. Whereas little relied on God, Abrams put his faith in the science of sport. Repetition in training and focus on time channel Harold's nervous energy. Harold Abrams is a player and in those days, it was a strictly amateur undertaking. And the idea you could just employ a, a professional coach to, to, to better your performance, but that you could afford to employ a professional coach. And this must have got up the noses of an awful lot of people. Under Musabini, Abrams would get the chance to race little again. This time in the 100 meters at the Paris Olympics but they were both due to face the fastest sprinters in the world, the Americans. Well, it's 6.30, Victoria Station. And this is where Harold Abrahams and Eric Little met up with the rest of the athletes on their way to the Olympic Games in Paris in 1924. They took a a long time, a long journey, and I'm going to find out what happened on the way. So, I better go, go to train. Okay, what's amazing reading this is our attitude towards the Olympic athletes back then compared to now. And in this biography of Harold Abrahams, he says, the British Olympic team departed for France in their ill-fitting blazers made of shoddy material, almost without comment. No first-class travel. They were in the back of the bus. In the film, 
Eric Little hears some shocking news as he boards the boat for Paris. Mr. Little, sir, and what about the qualifying heats on Sunday? What did you say? On Sunday, do you think you can beat the Americans? Little did refuse to run on a Sunday, but unlike the movie, he actually found out eight months before the Olympics, and he never buckled under the pressure from the establishment to change his mind. There's only one way to resolve the situation. That's for this man to change his mind and run. Don't say the obvious, Kidogan. We have to explore ways in which we can help this young man to reach that decision. I'm afraid there are no ways, sir. I won't run on the Sabbath, and that's final. Fortunately for him, Little was selected to run in the 400 meters, which fell on a weekday. But it wasn't a distance he was favored for. But today is a beautiful day, very different from July 1924. Harold Abrahams remembers we had a ghastly crossing, sea rough, and a risk of thunderstorms. I spent the entire journey keeping my lunch down and my spirits up by singing Gilbert and Sullivan. No, I, I won't be doing that. No sound at all, we never speak a word. A fly's foot would be distinct. This is a photograph of Harold Abrahams in his uniform. He wasn't pleased with it. Right here, he's wearing a pair of trousers that obviously for someone six inches shorter and a jacket for someone who's twice as big. And if you look at his face, he looks really, really hacked off, which I'm not surprised. I have eventually arrived in Dieppe, eight hours into my journey. I like the British team of 1924. I've still got a train to catch. Well, in my reckoning, that's... 12 hours travelling to get here from London and I'm absolutely knackered and I'm sure that Little and Abrahams and the others were too. I, they had to race there in the next few days. I'm off to my hotel for a good night's sleep. Feeling better after a good night's kip, I'm taking a taxi to a Paris suburb. No, I'm really excited because we're going to the actual stadium where Harold Abrams and Eric Little ran their races. I've, I've never been there before because we filmed all our stuff in Liverpool. Wow, this is it. This is where it all happened. This is the stadium that the Olympic Games of 1924 actually took place. This is where Harold Abrams did the 100 meters and Eric Little did the 400 on their gold medals and I'm finally here. Wow, this is fantastic, amazing. I know this is, isn't, no, this is more modern, but behind me there, there's, there's the original concrete seats there, just as they were in 1924. <laughs> The Paris Olympics was considered the first modern games. It had 3,000 athletes in attendance from 44 countries. And it was the first time an Olympic village was built for the athletes. So here comes the British team. I love this man. He, he's pointing out there's a little um, piece of wrought iron where the gates close together. And he keeps having to point out to all the athletes to beware. It's, 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 Thousands and thousands of them pouring into the stadium. It looks magnificent. In the movie, there was one person who wasn't welcome at these amateur Olympics. Abrams professional trainer, Sam Musabini. So that's the Olympic Stadium. That's it, Sam. It's as good as being in there, isn't it? Better! After nine months of training together, Musabini was well aware of Harold's fragile state of mind before the race of his life. He'd rented a cabin on the outskirts of the stadium to give Harold a place to mentally prepare. The scene was set. It was now all down to Abrams. On the 6th of July, he took his marks for the qualifier that fell on that famous Sunday. On this very track is where Harold Abrahams 
won that qualifying race that Eric Little didn't want to run in, which meant he qualified for the semi-finals. As he was lined up right here, waiting for the gun to go off, the Frenchman on his left moved suddenly. He thought that must be a false start, so he waited. But the race went ahead, so he started three yards behind. He managed to win that race and qualify, but his, his nerves were shot to pieces. All your talent scared. I've known the fear of losing. But now I'm almost too frightened to win. The final for the 100 meters fell on the same day. Harold Abrams had to wait three hours after winning the semi-finals. And then he was told it was going to be another hour. He said, I made note of this, he said, I felt like a condemned man about to go to the gallows. What happened next was remarkable. According to some accounts, Abrams left the stadium and hailed a taxi that drove him around the Paris suburbs to calm his nerves. Little was in the stands and saw Abrams' poor start in the semis. He wrote about his encounter with Abrams in the build-up to the 100 meters final. He said he told him, you were badly away, and Harold replied, don't talk of it, I saw five in front of me, but I won't be left a second time. And he wasn't. As Abrams walked out, the American fans cheered for his rival, Charlie Paddock, who reveled in the title of the world's fastest human. Abrams said later that the chance for the American favorite made him feel rejected, just as the anti-Semitism had. He used the chanting for Paddock to feed the fire in his belly. Mussabini had told Abrams to think of only two things, the report of a pistol and the tape. When you hear one, run like hell for the other. Abrams is just in the lead by a whisker. And he has that famous dip finish and, and, he's, and he wins. It's absolutely exhausted. Fantastic. Amazing. <laughs> Harold Abrams had beaten the American favorites, the first European to won the 100 meters, equaling the world record. But unlike winning gold today, there was no fanfare. I won the medal. My first feeling was incredulity, I think. Uh, no victory ceremony. No God save the king. Rather disappointing, and no presentation medal. The medal was actually sent to me about two or three weeks later by post. Little watched Abrahams win the 100 meters final, and interestingly enough, he was the first person to race down there and congratulate him. Eric Little's refusal to run on a Sunday didn't just affect the 100 meters. There would be another time where he put religion before running. Following in his footsteps, I've come to the Scots Kirk in Paris, which stands on the site where he preached. Yeah, on one of those Sundays in July 1924, in the stadium, seven and a half miles away, they were running the four by 100 meter relay. There was no sign of Eric Little, by the way. No, no, no. He was here in the pulpit, preaching to the congregation. The GB team came in third, by the way. Now, in the Manchester Guardian, they wrote, the British team was greatly handicapped by Little's absence being unwilling to compete on the Sabbath. 
So he'd, he'd rather be here preaching to a congregation than running his races at the stadium. Little had refused to forego his principles. Now he lined up for the 400 meters as a rank outsider in more ways than one. Little was placed in the outside lane, meaning he couldn't see any of the opposition. So he ran the 400 at the pace of a 100 meter sprint. So where does the power come from to see the race to its end from within? Abrams was in the stands watching Little run to victory, his head back looking towards God in his trademark style. He ran the 400 meters in 47.6 seconds, a world record. There's some people today say it's the best 400 meters ever run. That's where the story of Abrams and Little finished in Chariots of Fire. But the lives of both men took on a dramatic twist that wouldn't be out of place on the movie screen. A twist that would take Little to war in China and Abrams into the heart of Nazi Germany. The story of Jared Safar finished with Abrams and Little winning gold in Paris. I'm back in Scotland to see a piece of Olympic history and discover what happened next. Well, here at Edinburgh University, there's a, a shrine to Eric Little. So these are the crown jewels, really. Here on the left is the uh, medal that every athlete got from taking part in the games. And here's the pierce that was this does, the gold medal for the 400 meters. All that brilliance that he had is right here in that medal. A week after winning gold, Eric was back at Edinburgh University to collect his degree in pure science. He received a standing ovation and the principal, Sir Alfred Ewing, quipped, no one can pass you but the examiner. Having graduated, he was just here through these gates that his fellow students just lifted him up. They put a garland around his head like some Greek god and they carried him through the streets cheering. He was the most famous Scottish sportsman alive. A year later, at the height of his fame and with a nation's adulation, Eric walked away from athletics. He was taken by carriage through the streets of Edinburgh to Waverley Station with the crowd sung for he's a jolly good fellow. Eric was following his higher purpose, to serve God and follow his parents to work as a missionary in China. Eric returned to Tientsin, where he was born, to teach Chinese students. There he met and married Florence Mackenzie, the daughter of a Canadian missionary. They had three daughters, Patricia, Heather, and Maureen. I'm in London to meet Eric's eldest daughter, Patricia, who is my first direct link to her father. I sort of feel I know you in a funny way, or me, your father, <laughs> because making the film with Ian Charleston, it was like, well, it was like being for me with, with Eric Little, but would you say the film did a good job? My mother said, uh, you know, he, because of the movie, it gave him a voice. I have to tell you, the movie's been wonderful for we three girls. Because, you know, he died when we were small, especially Maureen, who never even saw him. The Japanese invaded China in 1937. With an escalation in fighting in 1941, things had become critical for Westerners. 
to Eric's and his family to the safety of Canada. As a man of principle, he selflessly remained behind to continue helping the Chinese. Eric's family never saw him again. China has never forgotten him, and he is their first Olympian. He was born in China, and he worked in China. And of course, he was just here for his education. <laughs> so they, they take him for their own. Yeah, yeah. In 1943, Eric was imprisoned by the Japanese in Weishin Camp, which is now a school. Two years later, he tragically developed a brain tumor and died. He was only 43. It's, it's really quite extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, when, when my father died in 1945, I thought, is that it? Is that all there is to it? Well, he's gone. And for us as children, uh, Daddy didn't come home. Mm. And it's wasted. But it wasn't. It wasn't wasted. And his, his spirit rides well, on. I don't think anything about your father has been wasted at all. I mean, yeah. And when we were making the film, Every day, David Putnam said, this is because Eric Little is smiling on us. Yeah, the film's been wonderful. It really has been wonderful. It's a mutual respect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we represented the two sides of the same coin, the gentleman and the player. You see, and he was the gentleman and I was the player. Since winning the 100 meters in Paris, Abrams had become increasingly obsessed with numbers and time. As a young boy, every year he tried to jump his age in feet. With a bank of photographers ready to capture his athletic prowess, Abrams tried to jump 26 feet, but he landed badly. He broke his leg, which ended his athletics career. But surprisingly, Harold was far from devastated. Athletics, to me, was an enormous mental strain, although I enjoyed the competition. One of the difficulties that any athlete has when he's got to the top is, do I stop or do I go on? The sensible people stop, because after all, there's only one way, and that's down. Abram's love affair with athletics continued as a commentator, but he faced a huge dilemma in his new career. The 1936 Olympics were being held in Berlin, and Hitler saw it as an opportunity to promote Nazi supremacy. Despite outcry in the Jewish community, Abrams decided to go. I'm meeting the one person who I'm hoping can shed some light on his decision, Harold's daughter. So your father went to Berlin with a Nazi regime in place, and why, why did he go? He went to Berlin with a heavy heart. I think he'd, he'd, he was in two minds. He'd got a um, lot of criticism here, but he really wanted to go. He said, I'm going to go for every Olympics. It must have been so unnerving seeing Hitler so close to him. He had Hitler sitting very, very close, and he used to tell me on more than one occasion, I wish I'd shot him. The Nazis didn't subdue Harold's enthusiasm for the competition. Commentating on New Zealander Jack Lovelock's dramatic 1500 meters race, he ignored the more restrained approach of commentators of the times. Harold believed in the Olympic ideal and that sport should be above politics. After Berlin, many questioned the future of the Olympic Games and said that the spirit of the Olympics was dead. But Harold disagreed. In 1945, before the war had actually finished in Far East, he made a broadcast, which I've got a copy here. The Olympic Games can and must play an important part in building a structure of friendship and understanding between peoples of different nations. It is totally wrong to say they breed ill feeling. You could say that, he, that your father kept the Olympic torch. Burning. I think he did at the time, yeah. Mm. Yes, I'm sure of that. Certainly his enthusiasm for it. I met Harold Abrams 
at the Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh in 1970. I can see him now in my mind's eye as a slightly owlish professorial type standing in the corner of the commentary box, um, always immaculately clad, but in what looked like country tweeds. But he was also festooned with stopwatches. He seemed to be fascinated by time. And of course, we would go to him after a race and say, Harold, what, what was the time on that? And to me, it's always an enormous pleasure to look back and to reflect that I once brushed shoulders with someone who in this field of activity was truly, truly great. Harold died in 1978. As an Olympian and a commentator, he had devoted his life to athletics. Without chariots of fire, Harold Abrams and Eric Little's remarkable story may have been forgotten. But this summer, what they stand for is very much alive. Well, the Olympic Games are just a matter of weeks away. The stadium's been locked down so even I couldn't get in. So I just thought it would be fun to have a look at it from the sky. Just coming towards the stadium now, it looks fantastic, it's huge. We've got the, the main stadium there, the velodrome is down there, we've got the whole village where all the athletes are going to stay over in that direction. Absolutely everything, it looks amazing. I, I, I can't imagine what Harold Abrams and Eric Little would have thought of this. Very different from Paris in 1924. With the movie being re-released in cinemas across the country, and also opening in a stage version in the West End. I hope a new generation can draw inspiration from Abrams and Little's achievements. Anybody who watches Chariots of Fire and the story of Liddell and Abrams will be much more convinced about the purity of sport, not as a sort of flag-waving passionate thing, but as something which brings greatness from rare achievements. I think Chariots of Fire brings everything together around achievement, hard work, dedication and success and it's an absolutely perfect time to bring a film like this to inspire everybody in our nation. It's clear to me that Abrams and Little embodied the Olympic spirit. In Eric we had his beliefs and with Harold we had his hard work and determination, two sides of the same coin. I fully appreciate the legacy they left behind. Without them, there'd be no chariots of fire, no Van Gallis music, and possibly no Olympic Games as we know them today. So this summer, I'll be flying the flag for them as I cheer on Team GB. John Sargent pays tribute to RAF Bomber Command who served their country during World War II tomorrow night at 9. At 10.35 tonight you can enjoy the greatest footy ads ever and there are some corkers. It's after the news which is coming up next. <laughs>